elephants. Welcome to Capet CFA Classroom. The topic for today is financial institution fraud. A fraud which is very very frequent among banks and financial institutes. Many of these frauds have one angle called bribery. Another fraud related to financial institutes could be embezzlement, loan fraud, real estate fraud, new account fraud and account takeover fraud. So in this session we shall be learning all those frauds which are related to banking and non-banking financial institution. Wherever the money is involved, the debt can fall under the same category called financial institution fraud. So let's start with the basic term which is very very frequently used in bank fraud is called embezzlement. Embezzlement is something where you take away someone else's property or money which the other person was having a legal right to own. For example, it is my money lying in my account and somebody else has taken it away. Now that's called embezzlement. So embezzlement term is used when without consent you take away someone else's property and the other person had a lawful right to have that property. So embezzlement is something which is very common in banks. Not something which is appreciated but unfortunately this is how it is. So other than embezzlement there can be a lot of fraud which may occur in the banks. The first kind of fraud which we are going to discuss is called dormant account. Dormant account is an account which is not active. When the customer has not done any debits or any credits from that account for quite a while. Now that duration may vary from bank to bank or country to country. Let's take a thumb rule of 90 days. So if a customer is not doing any transaction say in continuity of 3 months, bank might think and what is the reason that customer does not operate it and slowly that account becomes non-operating or a dormant account. So dormant account as a, as a policy auditor should be taking care of the dormant account and uh, the bank should try to contact those customers and if the customers are non-approachable then those accounts should have been closed. But employees are involved in this. So trust me any bank fraud or financial institution fraud is not possible without employees involvement. An outsider cannot do these kind of fraud just like that without any support internally. So in most of the frauds which we are discussing we are assuming that insiders are involved. So when we talk about dormant account employees are well aware of as to what all accounts comes under dormant account category. Generally in dormant account some or other amount is lying. No, could be small amounts of 500 rupees or something or those amounts can be misutilized. Now imagine the number of dormant account a bank may have. Even if you take a small amount, it can be huge. Now that is where we talk about dormant account fraud. So employees debit the dormant account, credit their own account or credit their own friends relatives account. And this is how this fraud occurred, we call that dormant account scheme. Other kind of scheme in financial institute may include suspense account scheme. A suspense account in a bank is an account which is more like a temporary account. Ideally, this, there should not be money in this account for a very long time. There is no reason. Now let's discuss as to why suspense account comes into picture first. There are a lot of transactions initially when bank would not know the exact source of it or there is some confusion regarding that for the time being the money is being parked in account called suspense account. For example, it could be interdepartmental transfers, it could be certain refunds where there is some clarity is not there, there could be some uh, loan processing amount which is yet to be dispersed and so on. So money lies in this suspense account for a time being, it's more like a parking account. So ideally the suspense account should not have a balance for a very long time. Employee misutilize the suspense account a lot. They simply debit this account, credit their own account and the money is taken away from suspense account. Anyways the source was not clear and this money will be misutilized. So that's what we call suspense account scheme. Other variation of financial institutions could be 
where the false entries are being marked from your account. So employees debit your account without your consent, credit their own account, that's another scheme. We call that false counting entries. The other thing could be done by employees that they debit a customer's account, credit and pay their own utility bills through your account. That's something they can easily do. Generally, a customer should have given them any kind of standing instructions or return instruction to debit their account and credit setting accounts. But as unfortunately bank employees have access to your signature, many times they, they get into forgery, they forge their signature and your account will be debited. So all those schemes can occur in the financial institutes. Now let's see what are the red flags. When you go and detect what are the things which you may find in those kind of frauds. One, you may not find a source document. So if I'm a customer and if I've given any instruction to bank to debit my account, there has to be a source document, some kind of check, some kind of voucher, which I may have given them signing that okay, debit my account and credit someone else's account. That source of document is missing, a red flag. If you find a photocopy of source document, it's a red flag. If you find unusual activities to suspense account or a dormant account, it's a red flag. So we need to be careful with those red flags which might occur in the financial institutes. So this is how the first part of financial institute works. Frauds. Now the next category of fraud which we are going to discuss is more related to advances or loans. We know that uh, a very huge income can get out of the loans. More than deposit, they are interested in giving the advances because that gives them more business, more profits. A lot of fraud can occur here. The first kind of scheme in this category could be giving the loan to non-existent borrowers. So employee may manipulate, they give a loan to someone who does not even exist through false KYC or false identification documents. The money will never come back to the bank because it has been given actually to the non-existent borrower. So that can be one of the scheme. Second would be sham loan. Sham loan scheme is a scheme where employees get a kickback from a customer and then they give the loan to someone who do not have a credibility or they should not get the loan. So the credit worthiness is not there, still bank give them loan and that's more like a sham loan. One of the red flag in sham loan scheme is that these loans after some time will be considered as bad debts and it will be written off from the books. Goes without saying that you are giving the loan to someone who will not pay. It is more like a kickback case. So after some time, employee does not want this loan to be highlighted, so they consider it as an MPA and try to write it off from the box. That is what we call sham loan. Then comes something called daisy chain. Daisy chain or loan swapping. This is a scheme which is not generally done at a lower level of bank. It is primarily done at the high or senior level. We all understand that bank's performance evaluation is majorly based on how many NPAs do they have, how many bad loans they have. So bank would not like to have too many bad loans in the books. What do they do? They swap their bad loan with someone else. For example, there is a bank A and bank B. Bank A will take its bad loans, swap it with the B and B will swap its bad loan with A. Now the loans have been crossed. For A, the loan which has been taken by B is considered as a new loan, vice versa for B. So for certain time, both A and B will be showing these bad loans which they have taken from each other as a new loan. So there are two purposes sought. One, the bad loans are out of the books now, at least for the time being, and secondly, you will book it as a new business which is again good for the bank's performance. That's what we call daisy chain or loan stepping. Different kind of loan fraud can occur here where there are double pledging. So same property is being collateralized more than one bank. There could be different type of loan uh, fraud which may include giving the loan to family homes. 
For example, I have collateralized a home and taken loan, but I was never a sole owner of that property. There are other siblings also involved in this property. So in this case, the bank will have a loss because even if bank wants to sell it, they will not be able to sell it. There are other parties involved too. So all those frauds can occur in this category, which are primarily related to loans. Here, the collateral can be misrealized if you just influence the valuer. He may give you a very high valuation of property, which actually is not true. Again, kickbacks are involved in these cases. So most of the loan frauds, bank frauds, real estate frauds may have a kickback as one of the very important ingredients. Then let's talk about real estate fraud. Real estate frauds are more, almost similar to what we just discussed here. The real estate owner, they are more involved into the fraud. Now let's talk about, say, any property which is under construction. How bank gives loan? Suppose I, as a customer, have purchased a house which is under construction. The bank will not give me the loan they will directly pay to the builder and they will not pay the 100% amount to the builder but they will only give it proportionately. The proportionate amount is the percentage of completion as to how many percentage of work is being finished in that property. Here developers do lot of frauds. They want to take their profits in initial stage itself. So they overvalue the property. So, for example, the construction which has actually had been occurred in this property is only 10%. But they will show a fake valuation certificate to the bank which will show that 50% work is already being done. And in reserve, bank will end up releasing 50% of the loan amount to the builder. Post that, the builder go away with that money which has actually has occurred in Delhi and NCR a lot. Or the builder will never finish this property or they can be any other variation of this. So that's what we call developer fraud. Developer can also do mischarging in their cost. So they may try to inflate their cost in terms of material, labor and overhead when they say that the actual expenses what they are incurring is much more than what they thought they will be. So here in the books they mischarge the cost, they show the cost as very high which is not so those variations can occur when it comes to financial institution developer fraud. So now we have understood the employee kind of fraud, we understood the loan fraud, we understood the real estate fraud. Let's discuss another kind of fraud in bank called new account fraud. It goes without saying that garbage in and garbage out. A wrong customer enters in the bank and everything goes wrong. So, what kind of frauds can occur in new accounts? Generally, the very frequently done fraud in new account is where people steal the check and get their account open. It can be done for business, it can be done for individual also. So basically the new accounts are opened with stolen checks. The new accounts are opened with a false identity. The mobile frauds. Now, how mobile is linked? In most of the western countries, you can deposit the money in your bank account through mobile or through ATM. In these cases, hardly there is interaction between bank official and a customer. We really don't know whether this customer exists or not. Because the money is actually being transferred either through ATM or mobile. So that can become a very big challenge. Now let's see what are the red flags for these kind of frauds. In new fraud account, Whenever you find a customer who is always look very nervous or in hurry in bank, it's a red flag. A person who opens account which is very far from his home or office, it's a red flag. There has to be genuine reason why would people go 50 miles away and get an account opened. So that is a red flag. Whenever you find that a person provides the identity proof which is very rare, which is not something where people generally provide, it's a red flag. If you see a very large transaction, money coming, money going in a new account, it's a red flag. So all these red flags need to be taken care of. And then comes account takeover. Account takeover is nothing but more like a hacking. 
These days, phishing is so common and people get into social engineering, get the personal information about someone else, the sensitive information and they misutilize it. So in account takeover, your net, via net banking, your account is being taken over by someone else. In return, they may either ask for ransom or they will misutilize your account. So that's called account takeover scheme. So with all these, we have understood that financial institutes may have different kind of frauds. Then comes what the worldwide bodies are doing for it. So there's something called FATF, which we understood in money laundering also. FATF stands for Financial Action Task Force. They have 20 recommendations. One of them is that whenever banks or financial institutes see any kind of suspicious activity in any account, they should inform their country's financial intelligence unit. Now that is something which is covered under FAT. Then comes Basel Committee recommendation. So Basel Committee has so far given three recommendations that is primarily related to capital adequacy of bank. Imagine what will happen if bank will give complete cash and give it as an advance. What will happen to the deposit holders? So that is where Basel Committee talks about a, a provision or a recommend, recommendation mandatory clauses as to how much should be the capital adequacy in bank. So there are different tier of capital, tier 1, 2, 3 and so on. This is primarily a risk based measurement so that the interest of customer can be protected. So this is how Basel Committee recommendation works. So this is how we have briefly discussed a topic called financial institution fraud. From examination point of view, it is important. The kind of question might come from this chapter may include red flags, may include some kind of uh, words say, they give you an example and they say, what is daisy chain? Or they give you a scenario and they'll ask whether it's an example of daisy chain or not. So something of that sort of questions can come. Uh, I would suggest that while preparing for this ex uh, exam, please read this chapter carefully. So that's all about this chapter called Financial Institution Fraud. And I wish you all the best for your exam. Let's meet up once again with a new topic. Till then, stay tuned.